for coming. Uh, I have my cheat sheet here to introduce Elizabeth because I can't remember everything, <laughs> but she's uh, an associate professor at uh, University of California in Irvine in the School of Education there. She is a learning sciences specialist, got her PhD in learning sciences from Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. And uh, she's been working in the arena of free service teacher education. She's interested in teacher thinking and teacher learning. And recently, she has also shifted her focus more to how teachers uh, think about and observe uh, equity in their classroom and how their own uh, stance on equity informs and influences what they do in the classrooms themselves. So that's a brief sort of synopsis of her research interests, and I will let her say whatever else she wants to say about herself <laughs> uh, to help us understand who you are, what you do, what you're interested in, and then what are you going to be sharing with us this morning. Great. Thank you very much for coming. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I think something most people don't ever talk about themselves, which is something personal about themselves, but I'm also a mom. Um, I have two kids, and probably um, Joelle had mentioned, invited me to come about a year ago, and honestly, my life was so complicated, because I have two teenagers, and I can't keep track of email all the time, and I was negligent um, with following up on that, mostly because they're really busy, and they keep me really busy, and um, work keeps me busy. Um, but I'm so delighted to be here, and delighted to be here with the room full of people who are here. Um, someone getting their teaching credential, someone getting their PhD, um, someone who does field placements, folks who are researchers, evaluators, professional development providers, math educators, science educators. Um, I couldn't be more pleased to be talking to this group. These are like my people, so I feel really happy to be in a room um, with all of you. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, some research I've done on pre-service teachers noticing. So the thing that um, strings my work over the last 15 to 20 years has been um, this work on teachers noticing. And what I mean by that is um, sort of what they're looking at, what they're paying attention to, how they make sense of what they see. And I have taken that up in a lot of different settings. Um, I've done some work with practicing teachers in video club work early on. That's what my dissertation was about. Um, I've done the pre-service teacher work. At, um, at UC Irvine. Um, we've redesigned our teacher ed program to be focused on one of our core strands is about really getting teachers to be thoughtful about what they're sort of what they are paying attention to and how that really drives a lot of their instructional choices. I've done a, a small project with supervisors actually of our student teachers. What do they pay attention to? So I care a lot about this idea of noticing um, as um, people, Deborah Ball and others, really think about teachers' knowledge being central to practice. Um, I really think about noticing. That's where I hang my hat as a researcher. Um, I don't know, maybe someday I, I'll say, well, that was all nonsense and should have been paying attention to other things. But that's, um, I remember the day, actually. And, and you, as a, as a PhD student, you might remember this. Um, I remember the day sitting with Miriam Sharon. We had spaces like you have here with whiteboards. And we were talking about something. And I said, I don't know. I think it's something about what they're noticing. And she said, what do you mean what they're noticing? I said, I don't know. I think it's something like what they pay attention to. And they're interpreting things. And she said, OK, let's write that down. And we wrote that down. And then we wrote that paper in 2002. And I really had no idea that anyone would pay attention to it. I really had no idea. It was, I was a very naive graduate student, had no idea. Um, but it was something in my gut told me this seemed important. So I guess here we are. So it's been kind of a productive line of work. Um, so I want to just talk a little bit about this work that I've done at UC Irvine in particular. Um, and I, I want to start by talking about how I anchor this work in this idea of developing a professional vision of teaching. So much of my work has been organized, um, um, has been influenced by Chuck Goodwin's work. Um, this idea that um, professional vision is um, the socially organized ways of seeing and understanding that of events that are answerable to the distinctive interests of a particular social group. So I really think a lot about this definition. Um, in teaching, we think a lot about the decisions that teachers have to make. In fact, I was reviewing a paper where someone um, appropriated the framework that Miriam and I developed and said that we talk about it as um, attending to, interpreting, and responding. And in my work, I don't add the responding piece. 
Um, not that I don't think that's important. I just think we, we focus so much on the actions that teachers are making and less about all the decision making that's going on behind that. So I have always tried to privilege that decision making. And in fact, I think it, Chuck Goodwin's work helps us think about other professions. Um, he talks about uh, he talks about uh, a, a novice archaeologist learning how to look at and make sense of um, the, the like what's going on in the visual field of their profession. Similarly, Miriam and I have talked about a meteorologist learns how to make sense of and and reason about the patterns that they're seeing um, in in visual displays. Right? It's just the attending to and making sense of is so much a part of practices. And so we've actually tried to, I've tried in my work, to really elevate the attending to and making sense of, because yes, everyone else in the world is talking about the practices and the, dis and, and the decisions teachers make, whereas I'm trying to foreground um, all of this other work, um, largely influenced by, by his work. So I ask questions, what do teachers attend to? How do they understand what they see? And how are they socialized to see and understand teaching in particular ways? Um, those are the three questions. And in my work, I really think a lot about developing a vision of ambitious instruction. And what I mean by that is the student-centered approach to, to teaching that we've all heard about in the field for the last 20 years or so. Um, and also, the, the, this is driven by some of Pam Grossman and Mary Kennedy's work that tells us that teachers lack a conceptual framework of ambitious teaching. So we have to kind of equip them with one. So let's give, let's help try to figure out what that looks like. Um, and they need, I think of it as pre-service teachers and teachers also need opportunities to learn to see teaching in new ways. Um, last year at AERA, Paul Cobb gave a talk. He's been doing all this work with these districts in Tennessee and I think a couple of other states now um, where they're trying to do all this math reform. And he said the one issue that they found is that these teachers did not have a vision of what this looked like. So really spending time to construct a vision is a worthwhile endeavor, I think, of um, teacher education. Um, and I really think that carefully designed, and the research tells us that carefully designed learning environments can be a support to help teachers develop new visions of teaching. Earlier we were talking about educative learning materials. Um, I think those are a tool that help transform practice. I also think participating in learning environments that help you learn to see teaching can be another component. Um, I would never say I have the component. I think it's a constellation of components and as the field we're all trying to put these together. Um, so, um, so the way I have taken that idea of professional vision is I've used the language of noticing in the work of teaching um, to think about that. And so when we look at a classroom interaction, we can think a lot about what our teachers attending to, how do they reason about what they observe. So if we look at this picture here, there is a lot to be seen. And if we were watching this video, there's a lot more to be seen. I'm gonna see, this isn't mine, so I'm gonna see if I can get this to work. If the little, how do I get the little, the little red light? Is it the red button? Okay, let's see. It Ah, doesn't do it on the screen. Okay, that's okay. So, um, so we can notice here that in, in this setting, every time I show this clip um, to both practicing and in-service teachers, everyone notices this boy who got up out of his seat. Um, really, uh, expert teachers do not notice that. They don't really cue in on that. They don't pay attention to that. But more novice teachers or teachers who are taking kind of this overview look of what's going on. And um, so they'll notice that. They notice this child has his hand raised. Um, they might notice the way the desks are arranged. People always notice there's something on the board. People notice this number line. In just a fixed image, there is so much to see, right? Um, but in a video where things are moving and there's interactions happening, there's so much more, right? And we have to learn how to see that. Now, I, um, as an early researcher, found it fascinating that people cued in so much on the person who gets up out of their seat. Because, um, I don't know, as teachers, we are not the best um, uh, we are not always the best audience and I'll be doing professional development and someone gets up out of their seat and I think I'm not worried about that but you're so worried about the kid who gets up out of their seat right or um, teachers will start talking and I'll say what well, now you don't like when the kids are talking but then you're doing it yourself right <laughs> I don't really mind that I don't mind it as a person like as a I don't really pay attention I don't let it bother what I'm doing but I find it so fascinating that we cue in on these things, right? What is it we're cueing in on? Why do we cue in on those things? Um, 
And so with pre-service teachers in particular, what I try to do with them is at the beginning of this course that I'm going to talk about today is to get them to be aware of what they're paying attention to and to start asking, why am I paying attention to those things? And that what I'm paying attention to is informed by a theory I have about teaching, about learning, and about the way I think classrooms should be functioning. And those theories are oftentimes ill-informed or, as we know from a lot of research, they're informed from our participation sitting in classrooms for 15 plus years, right? And so we have to undo, or we know from science education, undoing probably isn't the right thing. So instead, I have to take sort of the um, conceptions people have of teaching and learning and help them build, reframe, reconstruct, get some new language to really think about what's going on in there. So I designed a pre-service course that was intended to do that. That was intended to ask people um, both what should I be paying attention to, but also what should I not focus on? It's also as important to say I can't focus on everything. I mean, as human beings, we cannot focus on everything. So maybe if I stop paying so much attention, um, to the kid tapping his pencil, the kid who's sitting, whose desk is, you know, whose chair is tipping over, although I am always worried that kid is going to fall out of their seat. But we, pre we fester on that. So if we can stop focusing so much on that and listen to kids, and then once we start listening to kids, we realize that listening to kids can really be an opening um, for our learning from practice. Um, so learning to suspend attention is as important as learning to notice. So. Um, so in the last few years, I have really been thinking a lot about where does notice, noticing happen? Um, it happens while observing, when we just sit and observe and we try to decompose and make sense of teaching. It happens in planning. Um, I have a paper that I recently wrote with a colleague of mine that we wrote a paper about the different contexts of noticing. I think we talked about it sort of noticing in planning, noticing in teaching, and noticing in, ref in, in reflection. Um, and so in planning, people have to look at math tasks, for example, and really make sense of what's the mathematics here, and then think about how are kids going to think about the mathematics. So there's a lot of attending and interpreting that's going on in the planning of instruction. I don't think as a field we do a particularly good job at helping candidates know how to notice in those settings. Um, so that's something we've been playing around with at UCI. Um, noticing also while teaching, this is uh, there's a lot of work on this, so what are people attending to while they're teaching um, and how are they interpreting it and we've I've done a lot of work around that and then noticing in reflection which I think is somewhat different from noticing while observing sometimes you could just notice to observe because you just want to do that work whereas reflection has with it I'm gonna do something next and so I think of noticing as happening in all four of these contexts I think it's influencing each other um, but today I'm going to talk about this first quadrant because with pre-service teachers um, situated at the beginning of our program, we were trying to help them develop a vision of a kind of teaching. So I really think about it, it wasn't really to go act, they hadn't yet been equipped with tools, um, but I wanted whatever we were developing there to help them in their planning, help them in their teaching, and also help inform their um, reflective practices. So I designed this course, the Learning to Learn from Teaching course. Um, it was informed by research on noticing and lesson analysis. We used videos from expert and novice teachers' classrooms. Um, those were intentionally selected. We started with videos of Kathy Humphreys for the math people in the room. You probably know the Connecting Mathematical Ideas book. Um, she's got some great videos now on a, a new website um, that we use. Um, we also used videos from our teachers who were who were a little bit farther along in the program, but from the year before. So do you all do ed TPA here? Or do you do any kind of portfolio assessment in your program? Okay, so in, uh, in California, to get credentialed, um, our candidates have to do a portfolio assessment. And so they, they do the ed TPA, but those ed TPA videos come about six weeks into student teaching. So we used those videos um, so that our candidates who were early on could see those. Um, and then we also used videos of, from the TIMS um, video um, portfolio. Some of them um, 
of representing efforts to do more ambitious practices, others not so. And so we would try to decompose those and try to understand what was going on in those, practice, in those classrooms. We use research-based frameworks to analyze student thinking and ambitious math teaching. And then um, at the end, they design, taught, and analyze their own teaching practice. And there's a couple important things that I like to think about this class. Um, one is I like to think about it as I was, a, I was curating an experience. So I didn't come up with all these research-based frameworks frameworks. They were developed in the field. We use this stuff from Mary Kay Stein and Peg Smith. We use some work from a former colleague of mine, Kim Hufford Ackles. Um, she and Karen Fusen and Miriam Sharon came up with this really great framework for um, assessing a math talk learning community. It's one of my most favorite frameworks. Um, I use some of the stuff by um, O'Connor and Michaels and Resnick on um, uh, Yes, uh, science talk, but the, um, I'm, I'm blanking on the language right now. Um, but discourse, looking at discourse, not in science, they have another, um, I'm sorry, it'll come back to me tonight while I'm on the airplane. <laughs> Should have known what that was. Um, but I was taking these different frameworks that were, that were being developed in the field and then trying to ad organize them in a certain way and adapt them so that candidates could have access to this language to look at teaching. Um, and then, from that, with the work on noticing, I was saying, okay, let's not evaluate what we're seeing, but let's just stop and see what are we seeing. So now what I do in my class, I often start by just showing a piece of art at the begin beginning of my class, because people have gone to art museums and looked at art, and they've taken an art class where they dissect art. And we do this, and I say, what do you see? What's going on? We talk about this. Uh, 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 oftentimes a famous painting that they've been, you know, they've looked at before. And then I say, look, we're going to look at teaching the same way. And you, none of you said you liked that picture. You told me what you saw going on there. And then I'll show a video and they'll say, well, I really like how the teacher, I'll say, stop, time out. We're not talking about what we like. Let's just, what did you see? Let's just describe what we saw. And we spend, and we fill the boards with all the things we see, all the details of what we see. And I have found over the many iterations of the course, when, in about the second or third week when I do that in the course, it really minimizes the, um, this evaluative stance that they take. And I remind them, okay, don't forget, we're going to do the thing that we always do. We're not going to evaluate what we like. We're going to talk first about all the things that we see. And when we do that, we really start getting into the details of kids' thinking. It's not hard for them to get there. I, I just think they need to be reminded, we're not going to play that game we normally play of, oh, I really like how the teacher did X, or I really like what the student did. At the end, we can say, so what did that do for their learning? What kind of learning? How did that move their learning forward? Um, one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Hosun Kang, she uses this lovely language about moving learning forward. And so I'll ask them, so what did we then see? Did students' learning get moved forward? What evidence do we have? And then we start talking about the teaching. What were the teaching practices that move that learning forward? So part of it is just norming for them that we're going to start with students and then go back to teaching. Um, and oftentimes, I think, because a lot of the videos that are produced, a lot of the videos that are produced show teachers first. So I've had to do a lot of hunting that find me really good videos that aren't the teacher first so that I can say we're not going to look at the teacher first. Because I think the field has said, to improve teaching, we need to focus on teaching. And I don't think we do. I think to improve teaching, we need to focus on the learners, get people to focus on the learners. Then we could start looking at the teaching. I haven't written a paper about this, but um, my theory of what I think may, uh, with video clubs, when you're studying kids' thinking with video, um, and Miriam and I did write a paper about this, but I haven't written it in, in this way. I think what the teachers are developing by the way we've designed the learning environment in the video club, um, there are some intentional moves that Miriam in particular, because I was a novice to this, that she was making. And she was apprenticing them into a way of looking at video, which as, for those of us who do qualitative work, we all do this. And I think what we were doing is we were, we were treating student talk in classrooms as qualitative data. And then we're apprenticing them into a way of inquiring into it, which are what the practices are of, that we want teachers to engage in. It's the same practices. So I've been wanting to write that paper, and I haven't figured out how to write it. So if anyone has ideas at the end, I would welcome your, I think it has some stuff to, I mean, I've thought about it, but 
Um, but I think that's really because we can do all the practice-based preparation work. We can give them really good tools, but in the moment, kids are saying things and you have to stop and pause and listen and really pay attention to what they're, what they're thinking. We all know this in the room, but it's hard to do it in the moment. And we have to, that's I think what Miriam and I were equipping them to do, um, is to learn to take that stance. Um, so I don't know how much I need to make the case for video with this group. I think many of you use video, but I think now more than ever, we are in a place, technology in the last two years even, has made video capture and sharing so amazingly easy. Um, how many of you use the teaching channel? Are familiar with it? I mean, the, the numbers of videos that are up there right now, it's incredible. Teachers are capturing and sharing video all the time. That really wasn't possible five years ago in the way it is now. So we are at a time where teachers are really able to share their practice in a way they weren't able to do it before. Pre-service teachers, um, do you all use a tool like Edthena? Are you familiar with that tool? You're familiar with it? We're starting to use it right now. Um, but it is an amazing um, uh, video um, capture and sharing tool. Um, my favorite is a new tool that is not as user friendly. Um, I'm giving sort of a little uh, commercial for them, but I, the group who created Studio Code, which is a really great qualitative analysis tool, they now have some tools, um, con uh, uh, Connect I think is one of them, and iCoda is another one. In a few years, they're going to be really great tools for teachers and for us as practitioners to use with teachers. But we are really at a time where video is now becoming the text of teaching to study. And I think it's really um, an, an exciting time for us to really think about how that can really transform the preparation of teachers. Um, so in this course, what we did is in the first phase of the course, we really, I tried to introduce the candidates to these different frameworks. You could see the ones that are on the board. Um, looking at student thinking, looking at patterns of participation, trying to look at like what constitutes a cognitively demanding task, um, teacher questioning to elicit student thinking and promote conceptual understanding, and then classroom discourse. Um, accountable talk, that's what it's called, the accountable talk framework. I knew it would come back to me. Okay, so, um, so in phase two then, so we would introduce those, we would watch videos of practicing teachers, of, of of um, Kathy Humphreys and others using these frameworks to try to make sense of what we saw going on in those videos. Then in sort of phase two of the clip, I was really pushing them to get into more thick descriptive and analytic work around using those frameworks and then trying to get them to, in phase three, trying to see the relationship between the tasks people use, the kind of um, questioning that those tasks afford to, and, and engagement on the student's part, kind of participation that tasks can afford for students, and also the kind of thinking that they can afford, and then let's look and see if that's happening. So at the beginning, it's like, let's look at these discreetly. As the class moved, we tried to look at them in a more integrated fashion, because that's where the complexity of teaching arises, and it's hard to kind of keep all of those pieces together. Um, and we had 10, at the time we had 12 weeks. Um, I was able to convince them to give me two extra weeks, um, but now I only have 10 weeks and uh, it's a slightly different course now because I teach it with all candidates. At the time um, when I was first experimenting with this, it was just math candidates. And I think there are affordances and constraints of each. Um, okay. So the two questions I was asking for this research study was do secondary math candidates who participated in the learning to, teach, learning to Learn From Teaching course, do they develop new ways of noticing mathematics instruction? What's the nature and development of their noticing practices and how do their noticing practices develop over time? So the paper of this talk just came out in Cognition and Instruction um, in 2017. If anyone would like it, I'd be glad to share it with you because I'm gonna kind of give you the quick overview um, of that. Um, this is like old work for me in some ways, but I feel like I have to share it because it was like giving birth to a child. If anyone has ever written a paper for Journal of Learning Sciences or Cognition and Instruction, um, they are really hard, they're, they're, they're great journal, journals to publish in, but their editors make you work really hard, and this paper um, took a lot of energy. Um, okay. So, it, so there was one cohort of participants for this study. Um, we, the course is offered in the four, 
fall quarter of our three quarter credential program. Um, in California, candidates get their undergraduate degree in a discipline and then their teaching credential in their fifth year, except for our CalTeach program, which is like your UTeach program. We have a, a small number, you know, a small running program, about 25 candidates each year. That's an undergraduate four year program. Um, we, um, so for this study, I used a pre and post video analysis task. I would love to talk with other people, um, with some of you later. I do have some post data that was their EdTPA um, videos, and we did see some statistically significant differences between uh, the candidates from the year before this who didn't have the class and those who did in their teaching. But when I tried writing that up for CNI, they said, well, it's a different source of data. We don't buy the findings. And I'm like, come on, this is a publishable paper. But now I feel like it's kind of old. So I would love to get some people's thoughts on that and how to position that and share that. Um, so uh, maybe over lunch or something. OK, so we had two clips that we showed um, it, it, in the week two of the course. Week one of the course, as we all know, that's always like get to know you. So in week two, I did um, it, the, the, the class meetings were three hours long. So in the first hour, we watched two different clips. And I had them all have computers, and they had a sort of template. And so they were typing up. If they felt more comfortable, they were able to write up. Um, I asked them if they wanted to do the writing up. There were two candidates who did that. So then we typed up their responses afterward, um, which was kind of interesting because they actually drew drawings of what was happening. And I thought, oh, shoot, um, maybe they, the other students, if they had not been typing up, they might have drawn some stuff, too. Um, so we to showed two videos. One came from um, the Learning to Teach Linear Functions professional development materials that Nanette Sego and others developed. Um, they're very similar if you're familiar with the Learning to Teach geometry materials. Um, I just love these Learning to Teach um, linear functions materials. And she says, Nanette says they're going to come back in some other form. So I hope that, that they'll be out for us and as teacher educators to use. And then the Concord Consortium had um, this really great video of um, comparing cell phone plans. And so those videos were each about three to five minutes long. So what I did is we watched the video. And then they typed up their responses. There were three, um, four prompts. What do you notice? Describe what's going on in the clip. How did the teaching support student thinking and learning? And was anything else noteworthy? Um, and so they watched the clip. They typed up their responses. I asked them if they wanted to watch the clip a second time. They did. So we watched it a second time. They wrote up additional comments. And each video took about 30 minutes for them to um, view, watch, review, and then write their comments. And we did two videos. So it was about an hour long task um, in the class. I'm going to just show you a really quick segment of one of the videos. I felt like, how could I come give a talk about video without showing a video? So um, yesterday, I uploaded one of the videos. So at least you can get a sense of the kinds of clips we were looking at. Um, okay. So this is for the uh, equation for dial and go. It was really generous of the Concord Consortium to share all of these materials with me.
every every hundred minutes, they're going to have Okay. So, what's your spell time? Oh, yeah. Okay, so you get the idea, right? So we watched this clip, and these are the kinds of clips we watched quite a bit in the course. Um, even though the teacher's present, I feel like this clip has so much interesting um, student talk, and there's so much um, collaboration in terms of sort of patterns of participation. There's so many interesting things, I think, to look at this in this clip. And um, not surprisingly, at the beginning of the quarter when they watch this, they're like, well, there's only four students in the class. I mean, just such a fascinating comment, I think, right? Um, that that was their inference, rather than the, the teachers just working with a group or something, right? I just, I found it really interesting that that's the kinds of things that they were paying attention to. So when we started coding the data, we were looking at what were their um, objects of noticing. So in this clip, um, so um, in this clip, relative to the objects of noticing, I've just sort of documented here. What I did is I actually worked with one of my Calteach students who was a math major, and she and I watched these clips together. And I said, Give, help me with all the like interesting math stuff that's going on in here. And she did this with me with a bunch of math clips, um, which I thought was a fun way to get some of our teacher credential candidates involved in our research. Um, and so we did this, and, and so you can see there's some different things about student thinking that are worth seeing here. Um, the mathematical focus of, in the, of the task, I think, is um, in terms of sort of the, the, um, the high cognitive demanding tasks from Mary Kay Stein's work. We can think about it as this is high cognitive demand. And we wanted them to be able to be queuing into that when they're noticing. Um, what kinds of pedagogies here are for making thinking visible, right? So the way she's asking questions, the way she's generating discussion. Um, and then the classroom discourse, who's the source of ideas, um, who's responsible for learning. So the ways that we thought about these things, the reason I chose this clip is because for all those frameworks that we chose in the course, there were things that could be seen, right? So that's why it was a good pre-post. And it was one that I also anticipated likely in the early they were going to have things to say that weren't really as rich mathematically and about the, the discussion. Um, and it's also the case that one of the clips we showed was a whole class discussion and then the other one was a small class discussion because we're trying to talk about how both of these things are worthwhile in classrooms. Um, so then in, the, so in our data analysis, then what we did is we were looking at the shifts in the noticing um, by the cohort. So the coding scheme was informed by some prior research on noticing and lesson analysis. Um, we generated what these three different levels. Um, there was little to know it in terms of what was noticed and how they were noticing it. So a level zero was there was little to no attention to features of ambitious instruction. It was surpri somewhat surprising, but maybe not so much for those of us who do um, teacher prep work, was that early on they really weren't even noticing the task. They weren't even commenting on the task. Like what was the math people were doing in these videos? They weren't paying attention to that. Um, uh, and then we were looking at over time, did they become more detailed and inferential? Right? And then in terms of how they were noticing it, um, these sort of more overly simplistic observations with few links, and then over time were they starting to see interconnections between those different dimensions. Um, so we coded their pre and post for both video clips on those different dimensions. And so we, we went through and um, we sort of, so for, for uh, well, let's see. So, so for the what notice, we had those different dimensions of are they noticing math thinking, the task, um, discourse, you know, uh, the mathematical uh, uh, pedagogies for making thinking visible, those four dimensions. So then we would give it either, we'd, we'd read through the whole response and we'd kind of pay attention to zero, one, or two for each of those dimensions. And then for being like specificity and integrated, we would give it a zero, one, or two. So there were like six things we were coding on for the pre and the post for both video clips. And what we found was that at the beginning, um, there was eh, not, you know, about 19 of the candidates really didn't pay attention at all to the content or the learning goal. 11 did, but sort of in a more simplistic way. And at the end of the course, we saw sort of a movement to paying more attention to that. In terms of student thinking, little attention to student thinking early on, 
greater attention in the post task. You kind of see that things moved from like level 0, 01 to level 1, 2. Um, make pedagogies for making thinking visible, they were paying attention to that, but in a more simplistic way early on, that's why it's kind of level 1, um, they would say things like the teacher's asking a lot of questions. They weren't like really getting into the details of this, like what was nuanced about those questions that was moving learning forward. Um, and, and they still paid attention to that, but in a more sophisticated way later. Um, classroom discourse, they paid some attention to that. Again, I think they were paying attention like kids are talking to each other. Um, and then over time they were using, I mean, to me what's noteworthy for this is like you look at the level zeros in the post video, right? There's just not as much going on there, but really kind of at level one, which means they're really, they're attending to it and they're describing it some interpretation, but really not that much integration among that. We're going to see that at the bottom. So we see them getting much more specific, but they're not really making as many connections between like the teacher did this and so it resulted in this kind of student thinking, or the student said this and it impacted the other students thinking in this way. Trying to, they're, they're still seeing things kind of discreetly. Okay, I, that's not surprising to me. It's the fall quarter of their credential program. So you know, my feeling is like, and one thing I've been working on the last four years was trying to get our teacher ed faculty to see our program as a system and that we're all together and our courses are not discrete. Um, yeah, now that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a lot of reasons that's a problem and I, I it, it, uh, one of them is that the system, the university system does not reward that work for me to do that with the faculty. So, um, and to me, that's like the work I think is so meaningful and important because this course is like a launching off point. And if we could then get all of our methods instructors working in sort of improvement communities who are doing this work in winter and spring when they're in their student teaching, we would be doing so much more for our candidates in terms of kind of how they can be looking at teaching and getting better at their teaching. So how do, I, how do I write a paper that the university system is kind of like messed up that way? I can't really do that, right? Um, yeah, but you know, you still, I'm not a full professor. Um, so, okay, so this is a kind of, this is just a standard kind of comment in the, in the pre um, for the clip that I showed you. This clip is about a small group with a teacher discussing a problem. Students have the same graph and they're discussing the graph together. The teacher did not explain much. She only asked guiding questions. Students are very comfortable talking and discussing their thinking about the problem. They're able to discuss and explain. They can also analyze the graph to support their ideas. This way of teaching creates a good environment for students to talk about the math, explain themselves, and understand the problem. So like, this is a nice response at the beginning of the class, right? Like, they're kind of seeing, there's explaining, people talking, asking guiding questions. They did notice that there's a graph, but outside of that, there's really not much mathematical, like what's mathematically important here? What's the task they're working on? Um, what does explaining and talking? It's still at that like sort of surface level way of looking at teaching. And now I'm gonna point out some things that were noteworthy in her post. So students are working in a small group of four with the teacher. They're working on graphing a linear equation. A student starts the discussion with a question. One of them gives some reasons why the graph looks the way it did. They discuss the gra growth, of the gra growth of the graph. After every 100 minutes, it goes up $30. We can start seeing how different this is, right? So let me point out a few things. So in terms of the mathematics, graphing a linear equation, growth of the graph, slope and y-intercept, finding the slope. They're identifying mathematically what's going on here. Um, student, student thinking, the student starts a discussion with a question. They're noticing that the student has a question here. Students have a problem finding the slope. They use the graph and point, to, and point to the graphs to explain their ideas. They're queuing in now to what the students are doing. They're paying much more um, attention to the specifics of the teacher questioning. Asking questions to make students think about slope and y-intercept uses a student's incomplete work to give some hint to the whole group. It's much more refined to what's going on in this clip. They're seeing the details more, right? Um, so we can see here that in the course they can help them develop, that this course can help develop their noticing skills. I was not the first person to say this. There's lots of people who have done this, but you know, it's important to, we also, you know, when we're doing this kind of work, we have to say, yes, it actually did the thing that we wanted it to do. 
But my interesting, what I found really interesting is I was um, looking at the data. If we were to go back to that, um, the, where I showed you the shifts over time from 0, 1 to 1, 2, well, they weren't all shifting the same way. And I'm interested in variation. That's something I think is really interesting um, because I think variation helps us see maybe where we, where we need to offer different kinds of supports. I also think it helps us understand cogn cognitively what can be challenging for learners um, and where do we have to be thinking about um, how we design learning environments in more strategic ways. So I dug back into the data um, I, I asked the question, do they all develop in the same ways and what's the variation they're noticing over time? And there were three phases. Um, uh, uh, oh, I'm trying to remember why this is here. I'm trying to think what we did. Um, oh, I know why. We were trying to think about, were they just sort of learning what to look at? Were they learning to get descriptive and interpretive? And then were they learning to get more integrative, right? And so, so that was sort of like, what's the variation in those three sort of aims of the course? So um, we went back to, we looked to each case, we analyzed, um, we created these analytic memos where we were really trying to get insight into the variation. So yeah, we had this coding, but it's like, well, what's going on with each of these cases? When I look at them pre to post, what, what do I see here? So from pre, I might say, well, this person's really just noticing the stuff I wanted them to look at, or they were just using words, like they were just using language to describe stuff. How do I know that they like really understand it or they're just using it as labels? Although there's, I think, some theory that would tell us that just using the language helps us move, move us forward, so that's a good step at least. Um, so we were really trying to get insight into um, what's this variation among the candidates? And so we, we felt like we needed to write some analytic memos to help us do that. And then we studied these analytic memos. Um, and, and this was informed by some of Nikki Kirsting's work, um, Fred Erickson's work, John Mason and others, who really think about um, noticing as a practice. And so if we think of noticing as a practice, then what practices are they employing to try to make sense of what they're seeing? And so then we were looking at, do they shift differently from the beginning to the end? And are there some practices that support particular forms of noticing. And so this is what the CNI paper generated is this framework, um, which I think about this as sort of three broad practices for noticing and inside there was some sort of um, two sort of uh, dimensions of each. So if you're attending to features of ambition and uh, uh, attending to features of instruction, what we saw in the data is that they're using some generic frames to observe instruction. Um, and others are using framework terminology. So that's sort of the labeling of the frameworks that we gave. So they might um, say, the source of ideas are the students. Well, that's from one of the frameworks that we used. Now, I'm okay with that. At least they're paying attention to who's the source of ideas, right? But then are they understanding how being the source is moving their thinking forward is sort of a next level, right? Um, elaborating on observations means that they were providing more detailed descriptions or they were exploring details of ambitious, those features of ambitious instruction. And the, dis the distinguishing features there is that providing detailed descriptions, um, if any of you have done this kind of work, you might find that um, teachers or pre-service teachers will provide like a narrative description of what's going on, just a play-by-play -play account without sort of, um, uh, there's no sort of thesis or claims that are informing. It's like at the beginning, it started like this, and then this happened, and, this, and it can be really detail and rich, but there's no distinguishing of what's important and what's not important. Um, whereas the other one was sort of like, I'm going to notice that there's some interesting student thinking. I'm going to tell you a lot about that student thinking in more detail. And then the integrating is, um, this was super interesting. There were people who were doing what we called blending visions of teaching to analyze instruction. So they would use some of the framework terminology and do this really interesting analysis. And then they would use these sort of, um, they talk about learning styles. And I'd be like, learning styles? That is not a framework that we're using in this class. And, and so they were blending these visions, which I think is super interesting, right? Part of learning is appropriating new things, but you don't just get rid of old stuff. And so I think they're trying to make sense of what's going on. Um, that actually was like the most interesting thing, I think, for me of this data. And then um, the using a vision to systematically analyze instruction, um, I would say um, that's where they're really doing the thing that is our aim of the course. Um, and I'm going to show you what that looks like when it breaks out by people. How long do we have? 
10 minutes? Okay. All right. So I'm going to do this just really quickly then. Okay. So, because, you know, this is kind of interesting. But what I find interesting here is that, and, and this represents like sort of the numbers of people, right? So people came into the course, a lot of them using generic frames to look at teaching. But some of them were providing detailed descriptions. They were doing that narrative account. And there were a couple who actually were blending visions. Um, they might have, at the time uh, when I did this study, we had a master's program a with the, you could get a master's in teaching with the credentials. So some of the people would take some courses in the summer then all of them started the course in the fall in the credential program. And I, had, I did not look back, but I think some of those people who were blending visions were people who were in that master's program in the summer. So they'd already been doing a little bit of looking at teaching. Um, and one of them, I think, had done some teaching prior to coming to our credential program. Um, but what's interesting is, uh, so we, we can get the idea of what a generic observation looks like. And what's interesting is that there were a few, like three, who didn't change at all over the course. I think there were three who started generic, ended generic. Um, that's why the PACT, or now it, we, it was the PACT data at the time, now it's the EdTPA is what, we, but that's what was really interesting about that data is that two of those three people when we code their um, EdTPA data, they were totally looking at teaching differently. And I think there's something really powerful about looking at your own teaching, because that's what they're looking at. So again, over lunch, if anyone wants to help me figure out that problem. Um, some of them just switched from using generic frames to just the labeling using framework terminology. Some of them, and so this is, we see that they were really, like we would read it and say, wow, look at this. They're like really paying attention to student thinking. But notice there's really not much elaboration there, right, in these responses. Although the clip was short, we can still, still see student thinking happening. So they're look, they know that's a thing to look for, but they're not really doing much with it. Um, they're providing detailed descriptions. Some of them shifted just from generic frames to the more narrative account. Um, this is an example of that, and the paper has these examples. But I think what's kind of interesting is all these people who were generic really changed, like they, they developed differently. They weren't all the same. It's not predictive to just say, if you start this way, you're gonna end this way. Some of them really started exploring the details of ambitious pedagogy, and some of them were blending visions. Notice none of them really went to a vision, using the vision to really, um, uh, using the vision solely and really elaborating on that, right? They were kind of blending visions in, in, at the end. Um, some of them actually I found it interesting, their responses were organized by the frameworks that we gave them. That was, I thought, really interesting, like a, an interesting way to help, they were, so really that tells us in terms of, if we went back to Goodwin, they were really highlighting what they were seeing in terms of the framework. They knew to pay attention to that stuff. Um, Okay, and so then the blending visions is when you kind of see these two different things. Uh, math talk community level three, students share ideas and strategies, explain what they know and say, and this was really, so that's using that framework from um, Kim Hufford Ackles' work. But then, like, the next comment was, why, what does the teacher do when students throw down a pencil and lose interest? Like, we didn't really talk much about that in the course, and I'm not saying that's not worthwhile, but that doesn't happen in the clip. It's, like, really interesting that this is, like, what's, going on for them, right? And that's what they're trying to pay attention to. Um, Miriam, Sharon, and Rosemary Russ have written a really interesting paper about what informs interpretations. And they talk a little bit about this, like how people take their own experiences in to interpret what's going on, rather than sort of seeing just what's there and trying to make sense of it. Um, Okay, so then there were some, some of the candidates came in providing detailed descriptions. They moved to, to shifting their descriptions in terms of the vision of ambitious pedagogy. And then some of them, again, still were blending visions. So the difference here is that they got a framework to help them organize and think about what they were seeing and, and, and were able to then think about the details in terms of that framework. And then for this last group, what we saw is that um, the blending of visions for them was um, they then shifted to now um, being able to kind of say, okay, I don't, I don't need to look at everything. I'm just going to anchor in on these four or five kinds of things and really try to understand those four or five things. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying that issues of classroom management and all these other issues um, about it, that go on in classrooms are not important. Um, but I think we know that candidates have a natural attention to that kind of stuff. So I talk to them about, we're just trying to tip the scales um, and try to get them to be seeing other kinds of things that are more consequential 
for student learning. Um, when I say that, they say, well, you have to have classroom management first. And I say, well, actually, I think if you have tasks and you think about the discourse you want to have happen, that actually is going to resolve your classroom management. And I say, go experiment, try it out, and try it five or six times. Um, and they then say, OK, well, maybe I could agree with you. So I actually tell them try it 14 times. I have no idea if this is empirically true. But when I was a, a young parent, I read something that you have to um, have your kids try something to eat 14 times before they can decide if they like it or not, because your taste buds have to get used to it. So I've told them that must be the same way for trying a new pedagogy in your classroom. You cannot abandon it after three times, because you are setting norms. You're like getting their taste buds used to it, right? So. They laugh at me when I say that. OK, so this is like a shift for one of them, um, uh, really starting to see things in a more ambitious, uh, really starting to see more of the ambitious pedagogy um, in their practice. Uh, and uh, I'm trying to think about, um, I'm trying to remember how, I'm not looking at my notes, and I know my notes tell me why we liked this one. Oh, I know why. OK, so this guy, this was a super interesting response. He had like a list of quotes that things that um, people were saying, like a long list. I've only given three here. There were like 15. And then he would label next to, next to it, right? Teacher asked, teacher asked to explain, informally assessing. So he's like typing these quotes, quickly like doing something with them. And then he's writing at the end these more integrated responses. Um, super interesting reading his responses. And this, again, in, the, in what we saw when we look at the packed responses, um, they were really doing this kind of thing. They were really looking at the details of what kids were saying, interpreting it, and then talking about that in relation to what they were doing as teachers. Um, so this raises a lot of questions. What are variations in the visions of teaching that candidates develop through their participation in different contexts? How does that influence their noticing practice? This is why I did the study with the supervisors of student teachers. Um, supervisors and mentor teachers certainly have a lot to do with influencing the ways that people look at teaching. And I've been trying to do some work with our mentor teachers to develop some shared frameworks and shared language so that we can then all be sort of using shared language and shared frameworks. Um, that's a harder nut to crack, you all can imagine. Um, so I need a grant that would then at least get me to pay them to do some stuff. So I've been trying to get some funding for that. Um, what are similarities and differences in noticing practices when noticing in different contexts of the work of teaching? That goes back to that slide I had about noticing and planning, noticing and teaching. So I think there's some differences um, in those settings. And what are aspects of the course that need to be redesigned to, co to cultivate more robust forms of noticing? And I just want to end with this slide. Um, so uh, Hosun Kang and I uh, have a paper that's under review. Um, what I, what I, and the reason I wanted to share this is as practitioners um, who both work with practicing teachers who are thinking about using video, you might be using video in teacher education. Um, Hosun and I wrote a paper where we try to articulate the complexity of decision making on the part of, of teacher educators in using video productively. And so we documented sort of like what, the pro like what our processes were. So she and I sort of sat down. We wrote these cases of how we thought about using video. And then we analyzed these cases. And we said, wow, like we're really thinking about this. There's sort of this process that we're doing, which is sort of what's our goal? How do we, you know, you have to really decide what your learning goal is, both for the course and then for a lesson or for working with practicing teachers. What's that goal? Then you have to think about what's your theory of pre-service teaching relative to that goal. And then think about, like, they're in a learning ecology, right? Like, it's not just this one class at this one point in time. They're situated within this broader system. And we're trying to figure out how to locate these video-based activities in that system and over time, right? Um, it's not just this course. We're trying to get video embedded in our program. Um, we have two of us, Rosella Santagan. I'm sure many of you are familiar with her work. She's also a video-based. I mean, she and I write a lot about using video in teacher ed, and we can't get our teacher ed faculty to use video. And I'm thinking, like, people like in the country are using video a lot. Why can't we get the people in our own house using video? So that theory of pre-service teacher learning is there's something in there. And um, so we're trying to, she and I are playing around with like how we can do that. Um, Again, I think it's a lot about we have to set a vision. And we are that's why we're using Athena this year to give each other visions of doing that so more people will do it. Um, but I think there's like all sorts of considerations. What do you do before you view the video? What kinds of tasks do you set up? Um, sometimes you might want to have them do some work 
you know, if they're videotaping themselves, like before they come in, you want them to maybe send you something, do some analytic work around it, some, some work that they're doing. So sort of before, during, and after, and then how you select clips. So we're trying to put this out there as a framework to, um, and, and get feedback on it, because I'm not sure this is exactly the right framework. I'm sure that those of you who have thought about using video have some insights, but I'd be glad to talk with you about this more. Thank you. That was a lot of talking. <laughs> And those are my things. We do have time for some questions. Yeah. Follow up. Uh, but before we go into a question and answer type session, there is a coffee for those of you who might be interested. Uh, we have it back there. And feel free to get up and serve yourself while what the yeah. question and answer is going on. And then, uh, after we are done from here, we will go to lunch. I don't know where. Uh, but uh, everybody who's in the room is invited to join. Should be so desired to have a further conversation with the uh, and uh, the afternoon, also she's available. Uh, anybody who wants yeah. to continue to talk further with her, uh, she's here till about three thirty-ish or so, yeah. and then she will leave. So there is opportunity to continue the conversation with her. All right. So with that, we open up for questions. I have a question. So this was perfect timing for the mm. things that we were thinking about. So I very, very oh, I'm glad. Day. Thanks. And, and, uh, both in the, in the undergrad program, but also in the graduate program, I'm focusing a lot on thinking about video and the way that we can use it. And one of the things I'm curious about, have you found tools that you find helpful that scaffold their noticing? Um, so I was thinking, like, for instance, Mark Winchell with all the ambitious scientists, yeah. he had these kind of rapid response, rapid survey of student thinking, all right, that's oh, a tool mm -hmm. that talks about one of the different types of ideas that you're hearing as you're walking around. Mm -hmm. Have you found tools that help them notice while they're watching video, you mean, or, or while they're in teaching? Um, so, so one of the things we do in the class now, and and, and the class has been through different iterations, but I and I. Uh, so we do three things to help them cue into student thinking, and one is we've had them do an interview with students, and then they transcribe the interview, and it's the transcribing of the interview that's really critical because then they realize what they thought they heard the students say isn't what they thought they heard what students said. Um, so that's really useful. That's been a tricky assignment though because the pre-service teachers feel like it's irresponsible for them to conduct a clinical interview without telling people the answer. Uh, there's a belief there, right, about what the work of teaching is. And I try to help them see that actually a lot of the work of teaching is conducting clinical interviews. Um, so that's one thing. Um, the, the five practices for orchestrating productive discussions has the um, monitoring tool. So we have them, I now have them use the monitoring tool and trace student thinking. Um, but I will say it's a challenge for me um, because I have all content areas. And so I try to work with them when they're creating these lesson plans for what they're going to do to say, okay, well, like, just tell me three things that would be interesting student ideas that could be, I can't push them in all of the different, I don't, I mean, I am not a chemistry teacher. I can't do, like, I can't help them figure out the nuance of that. But at least for them to begin to think about, like, well, what might be interesting ideas? And if I don't know, how can I go figure that out? So um, and when they put these, when they come up with sort of, and, and the way I scaffold it is I have them do like a mini lesson that's something they feel like they know and can do pretty confident about, right? Um, and I mean, this is a pedagogy of teacher prep question that's a little tricky. So the tools I use are the ones that are out there that other people have constructed in the field, right? Like the monitoring tool, I have them look at the, the um, you know, the, the classroom discourse tool. But the one for, like, for student thinking in particular, um, I mean, I don't have a specific tool I use for that. We tend to just look at the video and then say, well, what are kids doing? But it's a really good question because I, I did realize recently, like, it would be good to have a tool for that. But this is where I think this class needs to speak to our methods instructors because that's where those, they can get more into the details of kids thinking around content. That I just, I can't do that. It's not my skill set. Yeah. Um, thanks for coming. And One thing that I'm um, 
this, this notion of ambitious teaching. Mm -hmm. kind of, um, I haven't heard uh, as much detail about that, and I'm wondering how is that similar and different than just saying standards based practices, mm -hmm. standards based teaching, and what value is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's a really good question. I think the the language of ambitious teaching has emerged um, sort of in response to uh, the prior um, sort of the no child left behind language, which was this just like very achievement kind of thing. And people in the field were saying that's just not sufficient. That's like not really setting the bar high for kids. And so let's have a vision of like a more rigorous. Um, I like the language also rigorous and responsive, where it's very responsive to students and it's high intellectual cognitive demanding work. And then the other thing I would add alongside that, which is the work I'm now getting into, um, I, not now, the last five years I've been immersed in it, um, is really thinking about equitable learning spaces, patterns of participation, who has access, who has power in the classroom, and how can that be more distributed among the students. Um, and to think about that from a competency-based frame. And so for me, an ambitious classroom is one that sees classrooms as every student comes in with competencies and strengths. Your job as a teacher is to try to figure out what those are. You're, ve you're high cognitive demand and you're very responsive to students. That's the vision, I think. that. And so Lonnie Horn has done some work where she talks about that. Um, but when in my appropriation of ambitious instruction, that's my definition now. At the time, I didn't have the equity piece in here as much, and now that's becoming much more. And what I'm really trying to do is try to figure out how that's every, in every, attached to every framework, like how, how we think about in terms of classroom discourse. Then I try to say, well, who isn't participating, and why might that be the case, right? So, um, so I'm paying attention to it that way. Not, so it's not an add-on. I think that's the important piece. Yes, I was looking at this. Uh-huh. Yes. Is this from, um, is this the ambitious, is this from Mark and Jessica's stuff? Um, you don't know, no, there isn't one. I mean, there's certainly the work that Elham Kazemi and um, Maggie Lampert and that whole group that they've been doing on high, what they call high leverage practices. Um, I like, I, I mean, I have such great respect for those, for those people, so I don't wanna be criticizing that work. I don't think it's sufficient. And my colleague, Vicki Hand, and I, who have been, we've been working on this stuff on noticing and, and um, inequity. Uh, one of our students who's working with us, we had this really great conversation this summer where I think we're trying to say there are certainly these high leverage practices, but wrapped around it are some other things that go on in teaching. Noticing is one of them. Positioning is another. So positioning is like, how are we positioning people in this classroom? How are we positioning the mathematics? Those happen through these practices, but you gotta be thinking about this level as well. I don't have an image yet for it, and I'm not sure what the other, like I could, I, I've been thinking about like something that's like three-pronged, so it's like noticing, positioning, and something else. I don't know what the something else is, but the conversations we've been having, having I think if we could get something like that, then we could have some sort of framework that would that would push the field more. Um, and I really appreciate the work that Mark and Jessica and others have been doing. Um, and, and they're really in the details of the interactions in teaching. And that's where the high leverage practice stuff is too. I guess for me, the way I've been thinking about it is like teachers have a conceptual framework that's driving all of those details. And I think we have to as we work on this, these little details of helping them learn to do these details in practice, we can be working on building a new conceptual framework. We could also be working on a conceptual framework that can then go into, so it's a reciprocal relationship. Does that make sense? But there isn't, I don't think of one site or one tool. I mean, I'll show you the one we've been working on. Yeah, I would love to see it. I mean, Kathy Humphreys. Um, who did the work with Joe Bowler. She has a really great website called Inside Mathematics um, that has elementary, middle, and high school cases, but I haven't seen it sort of in the same way. I, I, I think of it, I, I don't think it's owned by one person. Um, it's kind of funny you say that because I've been sort of thinking about myself as a curator, and so I've actually been thinking we need a curated site that brings together some of the really great work of Mary Kay Stein and Peg Smith. I think they have some really wonderful tools 
Um, there's some, so I think there's a lot of tools out there, but they're not all integrated in one place. Maybe they are, I don't know. Do you know of a place? I can't think of a place. That's a good project, though. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I used to teach classroom interactions. Knowing and learning. Yes. And, and um, Rosella Santagata teaches knowing and learning, and I used to teach classroom interactions. Um, but I, you know, we can only teach so much. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we definitely used a lot of this kind of model for the knowing and learning course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you, are you on semesters? Yes. Yeah, you're so lucky. <laughs> you really are lucky. Yeah, I, I think, oh, if I had 16 weeks, 14 weeks, you know, but 10 weeks is just, so classroom interactions is a little tricky with 10 weeks. It's, um, we kind of have like two, two semesters of it, but there's other things that have to go on inside of it um, that are UCI specific, that are, yeah, it's comp it makes it hard. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. I like to have the transcript with me, um, and and I've had undergraduates who I hire as like you know GSR like undergraduate researchers who will transcribe videos for me, um, because I think transcripts really help you see what's going on and really study it and play around with it. Yeah, yeah. Well, not always. I mean, because sometimes materials don't come with them, and so then, um, and and. So then if I don't have time to make it, I'm like, oh, well, we're going to watch a video. And then, but I, I, I think the, if you have the transcript, you can get inside the interaction more. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so my second question is more on methodology. Mm -hmm. is if you would talk a little bit about how you constructed your levels. Uh-huh. Yeah, it was a headache. <laughs> really. I mean, there probably should have been like four levels. I don't know. I mean, for those of you who do this, like the qualitative work, yeah, it is, um, you know, and someone's always saying, well, why aren't there, why isn't it level one, two, three, and four? And what, and, and um, I mean, it, for us, it was a team of us. There were four of us. This is why this paper was like giving birth because we would really go in so many rounds and I had, and um, both res the I've, I've taught qual methods the last few years, and so I had to do a lot of reading in qual methods that made me feel better ab about our methods. That's why I'm saying that, because um, Miriam and I would talk a lot when I was a graduate student, and I would ask her this kind of question, and sh there's something about your gut is telling you something, right? These distinctions, and scientists don't like the gut telling things, although scientists, of course, use their gut as well, um, and so. Um, when we, we would try in some cases to say, okay, well, we kind of knew level, like the low level was like, they're just not doing this at all, right? And then there was like, are they doing it at all? And then what's in between? And then we would, we would kind of create stacks. That was like what we were doing, right? We'd create stacks. And then, and that's where these analytic memos became really critical because we would say, well, all right, is the case of Mary, one of her clips, she's really, from pre to post looks really different from the other clip. So then we'd have to really think about, so what is Mary's noticing like then? What is it about the clips? Like, what was it that the clips afforded? That's probably another paper to be written and haven't written that paper, but different clips afford different forms of noticing, right? But I will say it was a very iterative process and it was literally us, like, we'd read it and we'd sort. And then in our sorting, we would say, why are we putting these people in this category? Why are we put, why did we put all these people together? And then we try to put some language to that. And that's how we, and yes. And then from that, that helped us see, there weren't really four levels, there were three. Um, and then of course there were some judgment calls that we had to make. 
you know. But that's also why I think when they asked me to revise the paper for CNI and like we did the the different variations, that actually revealed more of some sort of the interesting nuance that I think the 012 wasn't capturing. And so I think giving that language to those practices was helpful in that way. So maybe that's another paper you go back and read about control. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's the, the framework of that. I mean, trying to articulate these frameworks we use to assess noticing, I think, is an important um, step for research. Yeah. So what instructional intervention of the training happened in a pre-analysis So, I mean, it was all of the course, right? It was, in, it was a lot of watching of videos. Um, we would, in the beginning of the course, in the first three, probably in the first four sessions, we spent, like, um, we spent one whole session just watching like three clips that were just like, let's talk about student thinking. And, and so when we do that, for example, we do the task, we, let's do the math task together, we would do the task, we'd then watch the video, we'd have the transcript, we'd unpack it. I, it was very much like a... So the math task would be the same task that they did on yes, the video? Yes, that they did in the video. Mm -hmm. So we would do that task and spend time doing that task, which was actually really interesting with the Calteach people doing the math task versus the non-Calteach people. That's another thing that's really interesting because our Calteach students, like they're math majors, right? Like they are really mathematically savvy but, and, and very bright. But when you're trying to get them to look at student thinking of math, they're like, well, they get it wrong. They're like, it's a correct, incorrect thing. And so we have to work a lot on that um, with them. Uh, with, so, we, so we always do the math task. Then, and that you know, takes about 10, 15 minutes. We do the math task, we talk about it. Then we also talk about like, what, what might be some confusing things for students about the math task, try to open that up a little bit. Then we watch the video, what are some interesting things that you see the students doing here? Is it similar to what you thought you would, you know, from us doing the work, similar to it? This is actually an affordance of having the class now be all content areas, is that what, what I try to do is, for six weeks, I try to do one, We'll try to do one video that's math, one that's English, one that's social science. And then what I do is I put them in content, uh, I put them in content mixed groups. Then I have the English person do the task with the English people, right? Interpret it, and then they see all these errors people make or all these confusions or misconceptions because you know these people haven't been thinking about Shakespeare's sonnets or they've been, they're not, you know, they're not really great at building scientific models of photosynthesis if you're an English major. And, but what it gives them insight into is like these are smart people in the room and they've taken science, they've done all of this content before so let's do the content together. And so it gives them actually some access to students without having real students to do that. So that is an affordance of the new model of the course. Um, and then, so then we watch the videos, we unpack it. And so then, and then always with every, as the subsequent courses, you know, subsequent um, sessions, in the next session, so we would watch it. We'd always watch a video first, let's study student thinking. And every time they would talk about the teaching, I'd say time out. We're, I'm gonna hold that over here. We're not gonna talk about the teacher. Let's just talk about the student thinking. Let's unpack that. And then, okay, now we'll go back to the teaching, but we're only gonna talk today about the questioning. Let's look at the transcripts. Let's look at the questioning. In the Bowler and Humphreys book, she has this really nice um, framework for teacher questioning that I've reorganized a little bit. And so I say, okay, so what kind of question is happening here? And then we study how, because they always think, they'll start by saying teachers ask a lot of questions. I'm like, that's, yes, teachers always ask questions. <laughs> That's not interesting. It's, it's, what's interesting is what kinds of questions they ask and how they build their questioning. And that's some of the Mark Winchell stuff, right? Like you, you might need to do some eliciting and then you're gonna ask the really key question that's gonna then move them to the next level. You might see a lot of low level questions. I don't care if there's a lot of, that's when my stu graduate students also code for questioning and they, they come up with these numbers. I'm like, if that's not what's important, it's, the, it's like these little packets, I think, of, you know, the, that we were talking about earlier, these packets of questions that come together. So I try to help them see it's not just that they ask questions, it's not that they're asking lots of low level or high level questions, it's how these questions in an interaction are building up to a moving learning forward. That's really hard to see, right? That's like really, really hard to see. Um, and then I go ask them to do that with their mentor teacher's class and then they come back, you know, and they bring that back. 
And so each, core, each class then, then will take the, the discourse framework. Now we're using the accountable talk. We used to use the Hufford Ackles framework. Now we use the accountable talk. Okay, so what's, how are, how's accountable talk happening in here? And we look at that relative to the student thinking and how that's moving thinking forward. So it's a lot of studying of the transcript, studying of the video, and, and to learn from practice. The nice thing is some of the candidates tell us that in the spring when they student teach, they create their own little um, little uh, PLC groups and they do some of this stuff. So I'm like, yeah, that's like, that's what I want, you know? It's super cool that they're like doing that on their own. Yeah. Okay. Have you tried instructional around? Have you, have you tried to do it? I haven't. So Danielle and I have been playing with it. Yeah. As a, a, a different type of teacher education pedagogy is mm -hmm. trying to get the same thing, but mm -hmm. with the challenges of a Right. Well, I think it's, it's been a really powerful addition to this. Yeah. Because we are in a real teacher's classroom in real time, and then afterwards, after we have a chance to talk about it and they can you know, frame it around noticing mm -hmm. perhaps a specific thing, yeah. then that teacher comes and sits down and they prepare questions and the teacher talks through why they were why they did what they did. Mm -hmm. And I found it what, what I thought was actually most useful about it was so we had this framework for the program that allowed us to start layering the language and naming things yeah. right, that they were talking about. And so they could see how this, this framework they're brand new to, they really know, know nothing about yet, and how that mapped on to this, this person's classroom, like yes. their name has been in their room. Yeah. And they're saying the same thing. Yeah. And that, it's very targeted. Those are the right teacher on the right day that we talk to, and, right? You don't yeah. just walk into a room. but. It's been a I think it's been an interesting kind of addition to the video clubs um, of doing that. We only do it a couple times early on in the program, but I think it gives us, frankly, some credibility for the ideas. Oh no, because for it's, sure. It's really, it's yes. Yes, no, for sure. I mean, I, I think of this as just like uh, again, as I said, the last four years we've been trying to get our our faculty and the credential program sort of really trying to integrate our work. Um, and part of that has been surfacing, like, what's our pedagogy of teacher preparation? And um, some of them still really believe that the way you learn to teach, and I'm not, I'm not saying it's wrong, I just think it needs to be complemented, is by they'll, they, they just do a lot of the experience, the lesson, the way the students would experience it, right? And so they, um, so they do, and, and that's fine, but the, they're still in the position of the learner. They're not, they're not the one thinking of all the decisions they have to make as the teacher. And so I, I, we're not, that's not sufficient. It's a, it's a very good pedagogy if, you, if they've never experienced that, certainly. But if that's sort of the, if that's really, they, we need to wrap it around with the instructional rounds, with, with lesson study, with video analysis. Those, all of these need to come together. And that's just been a hard challenge to sort of, so what we're trying to do is say, who wants to try this together? Let's just do small projects together. And then we think those small projects will begin to um, percolate and grow in the program. Um, and that's something, you know, when I talk with people at Michigan State, or I talk with people at University of Washington, or I talk with people at University of Michigan, the places I think of where really teacher education is like the center of a lot of what's happening and teacher preparation, the pedagogy of that, they've been at this for 20 years. It, they, it's not a quick thing and it does take buy-in, it does take people being willing. So I, I think what I try to do is just, show, oh, here's this new thing. And with Hosan there, that helps too because she's also trying to do those kinds of things. Yeah, innovate on pedagogy. I really want to thank you for coming on a Friday. I know Fridays are not the easiest day, so I really want to thank you so much for coming. It really is, um, it was such a pleasure to be here. Thank you. I appreciate it.